Thank you, Jimmy. That's one of my favorites. Let's pray. Lord, through the power of your Holy Spirit, bring your light to our spirits. Help us see and to hear your message. In Christ we pray. Amen. In the second letter that Paul wrote to the Christians living in Corinth, he reflected to them their growth in faith and discipleship. He interpreted their faith as evidence of God's grace at work in them. He said that God's grace was enabling them to do gracious work. Before approaching the sermon text, though, there is a little bit of understanding about that Greek word for grace, charis, that we need to consider. Charis can be translated into English using several different English meanings, not just the one usually used in Bible translations, which is grace. Grace and its companion, gracious, have been adopted into and used by Western culture so much that at times it dilutes the sacred meaning of grace. So chorus can also be translated mercy, goodwill, a favor, an expression of kindness, and a special manifestation of divine power. That last meaning, a special manifestation of divine power, allows us to consider Paul's use of the term in today's sermon text in a way that gives a little bit different perspective from which to think about giving. So with that meaning of grace in mind, listen to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 7 through 14. But just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in your love for us, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. And here is my advice about what is best for you in this matter. Last year, you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now, finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what he does not have. Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard-pressed or impoverished, but that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need so that in turn, their plenty will supply what you need. Then there will be equality. This 
is the word of the Lord. In this part of his letter, Paul reflected to the Christians in Corinth the way he saw them as Christians. He saw that they excelled in everything, faith, speech, knowledge, earnestness, and in the love that they showed for Paul and his helpers. But there was one thing in which they still needed to excel, and that was giving aid to struggling Christians in churches in other cities. He said that a year ago they had expressed a desire to help and had even started to act on that desire, probably beginning to save up money that they could send to other struggling churches, but they had not followed through with their desire. Intending to, wanting to, planning to, taking the first step to help are all well and good, but unless at the end of the year there is a check in the hands of the people who are struggling, all that wanting, planning, desiring are of no use. Paul exhorted the Corinthian Christians to understand giving financial aid to fellow Christians as an act of love, and he saw a connection between grace, love, and giving. Normally, we tend to think of financial matters as existing outside the realm of love and grace, especially outside the realm of divine love and grace. That old phrase, filthy lucre, comes to mind. Yet, here, Paul put the matter well within the divine realm to the point that it became a special manifestation of divine grace, divine power. To begin to understand what he's getting at, we need first to consider the idea that love and the ability to express love come from God. God places within us love for God, love for others, and even love for ourselves, that healthy kind of self-love. It is the love that God puts within us that enables us and empowers our love toward others. There is a natural human love, a natural human love of God and others, but that human love tends to involve self-need more than a desire to do God's will and to receive, to relieve the need of others. The result is that love is given only as it is also received. Love has to be reciprocal, we say. Someone loves us, and in return, the love knowing that we will receive love from them motivates us to give love to them. But God places within us love for others even when that love is not returned to us. We love even those who do not love us. We also need to expand our understanding of money in the context of wealth. 
wealth is a bit broader than just financial or monetary wealth. When we think of wealth, we think not only of money, but of many other things as well. Natural resources, reservoirs of knowledge, specific talents, land and real estate holdings, family relationships, the material possessions we acquire, and yes, the dollar bills and the coins that we have in our savings account. All of those forms of wealth, and surely there are many others as well, can be shared with others. Putting all this together, we can understand Paul to be saying that the giving or sharing of our wealth with those who are in need is a manifestation of divine power. Now, sit with that notion for just a few seconds, and when you get home, find a place to sit alone with God and consider that notion for many more minutes. Manifestation means something within you is visible to others. You show forth what you are like on the inside. For example, a person who is generous by nature manifests that quality through the generosity shown to others. Jesus manifested divine power and God's love for us all, not only when he came to earth as a baby, but also when he laid aside his own will and went to the cross and suffered death, that God's plan for our salvation would be actualized. It would become an actuality in us, for us, through us, and out to everyone. Through Jesus' actions, we see the divinity that was as much a part of him as was his humanity. We will never have that kind of divinity within us. We are not begotten by God. We are born of flesh and blood. But when we are born that second time, born of the Spirit, we have within us the divine power to live as children of God and to fulfill God's purpose in creating us. That is our contribution to the coming of God's kingdom. Born of the Spirit, we too excel in faith, speech, knowledge, earnestness, and in the love toward those who care for us the way Paul and his helpers cared for the churches that they shepherded. But like the Corinthian Christians, perhaps we need to pay more attention to the ways in which we follow through on our desire to share our wealth. And here we need to pay attention to what Paul told the Christians in Corinth about their wealth because it is as true today as it was then. We can have a great desire to help others, but we may feel certain that we do not have enough to make a meaningful contribution. Paul was concerned about that misunderstanding. He said that if the readiness to help is there, then it is acceptable to give according to what a person has 
not according to what he or she has not. The idea is not to impoverish yourself so that someone else can enjoy abundance. No one is to be impoverished. That's the goal. Remember, wealth includes many things, not just money. <coughs> Perhaps you can give only a very meager amount of money, but perhaps you have talent for making infant and child garments and can, can provide some handmade clothing for people in need. Perhaps you do not have more than a few pennies to spare, but you have a fruit tree in your backyard that is producing way more fruit than you can ever use, and you can share that produce with those who are hungry. An important point that we need to derive from Paul's message about giving is that both the desire to give material aid and the actual giving of that aid together manifest the divine power within us. We have the desire and follow through with its actualization because it is basic to who we are as children of God. We do it not in order to have the gift reciprocated. We give out of love care, and concern that are characteristic of our inner nature. Seeing the relief in someone else's eyes. Seeing that big smile on someone else's face. Seeing that healthy glow on someone else's little child's face is more gratifying than all the coins and the dollar bills that we can amass or all the cans of food in our overflowing pantry. What Paul said to the Corinthian Christians, I believe he would say to us, it certainly applies to our need to support our mission efforts both in our own town, in our own neck of the woods, but also around the world. There are Christians in many places who are living at a subsistence level. No contribution is too small. The important question for which to search your heart for an answer is whether you have the spirit desire to relieve the need and the suffering of others. As an example of the importance of a small and medium-sized gifts Consider that this church, like most churches I know in whatever denomination you want to mention, has giving research showing that about 40% of the church's income comes from just a handful of donors. The other 60% comes from the small and medium-sized monetary gifts. Now, one could certainly say that the church is not going to make it without that 40% of very large donations. The reality, however, is that the church would not make it without that 60% 
of small and medium-sized gifts either. Often the larger amount of people who give the smaller donations make up a large pool of people who are wealthy in other ways and give liberally of their time and their talents. Take away 60% of the people and all they give, and the church would be significantly impoverished. No gift from any kind of wealth is too small to be of great meaning to the church or to churches and missions outside our local church. I like to recall the final scene in that classic Christmas movie, It's a Wonderful Life. I'm sure most of us are familiar with that scene. In order to bail out the main character, George Bailey, from an embezzlement mess that he did not create, the people from the town made contributions, placing them in that large wicker laundry basket. There were coins, dollar bills, a pocket watch, a wire from a friend overseas wiring a whole huge contribution that would have more than paid for the amount of money needed to wipe out the embezzlement charge. And there was a ripped up document warrant for his arrest. The whole townspeople, the whole town came to his home with his wife and presented him with this basket of gifts. That's what the kingdom of God looks like. And that is what Paul says the church should look like too. The question is, does this church look like that? Paul says, I give my advice. If the readiness is there, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he or she has not, to fulfill the desire to share of your abundance so that he who gathers much has nothing left over and he who gathered little has no lack. So let it be. Amen. Let us stand and say what we believe using a portion of the Confession of Belhar. We believe that Christ's work of reconciliation is made manifest in the church as the community of believers who have been reconciled with God and with one another, that this unity of the people of God must be manifested and be active in a variety of ways in that we love one another, that we experience, practice, and pursue community with one another, that we are obligated to give ourselves willingly and joyfully to be of benefit and blessing to one another. Our next hymn is number 292, God of Grace and God of Glory. 